I remember the release of A Head Full of Dreams in 2015. I've mentioned on the channel before that I personally don't like the style of pop music that was coming out in this era, and this video will be an excellent opportunity for me to explain why, as I feel this album, and the singles especially, really sum up what 2010's pop music sounds like. But is the 2010s the decade we associate Coldplay with? Indeed, how many of you watching are of the opinion that their first three, maybe four albums were good, but the band quickly fell off afterwards? I've been covering debut albums on this channel, and with my association of Coldplay being very much the 2010s era of their music, imagine my surprise when I listened to Parachutes in full for the first time earlier this year. It's a radically different sound and different approach to what they would pursue later on. And so I guess that's what this video is. It's a comparison between the early Coldplay sound, a more pop adjacent alternative rock sound, to that of their modern sound, a more commercial sound, more singularly pop oriented. So if we had to sum up 2010's pop music, what do we think of? Yes, there were trends. In the late 2010s, we saw the rise of the pop drop typically a hook laden and repetitive section that would come directly after the chorus. Plus, we have what Rigbiato humorously calls the Sasada rhythm, referencing the kinds of fast, usually synthesized roles you would see on hi-hats in the drum groove. But I don't actually want to focus on trends. Trends simply come and go. What do we associate with the 2010s in terms of actual sound? First, I would cite the rising influence of electronic dance music. Traditional rock instruments like guitars and having acoustic drum kicks mic'd up were falling out of fashion, replaced with greater use of synths and heavy reliance on the tools and plugins found within digital audio workstations. Likewise, EDM songs would boast not necessarily the most dense of arrangements filled with a variety of different instruments, but huge sounds in terms of the relative size of every instrument in the mix. Much of this was achieved by a production technique called compression, a tool that allows the louder parts of your song to become louder while quietening the louder spikes, which at its extreme could lead to what you could call a square waveform, crushed of all dynamics. Following the financial crash of 2008, we interestingly did see a rise in colourful, happy sounding pop music, and part of me wonders if the popularity of this came about out of people's desires to escape their everyday economic woes. There was a counter movement in the 2010s led by the likes of Lord and Lana Del Rey, but overall and in general, I found that the pop music industry really doubled down on this overtly positive mode of songwriting. And though I am in no way trying to say that positive songs are bad, I do feel there comes the point where the songwriting and these songs can begin to sound overly simplistic and even a little disingenuous. Fellow YouTuber42 put out a very successful video named why is pop music so awful? And in the video he mentions a lot of the common tropes that we hear time and time again in relation to pop modern pop music. We hear the idea that these songs are becoming harmonically simpler and indeed more simpler to each other. We hear that the lyrics are becoming less and less intelligent. The reading level of them is going lower and lower. We hear that the hooks of these songs are becoming simpler and more repetitive. Now, we can argue the validity of these arguments. And of course, it goes without saying that there is a whole world of music outside of the pop charts, which is becoming increasingly more diverse and boundary breaking. But I have to admit that during the peak of this period, of pop music, I was very much in agreement with these criticisms, and I myself was becoming very disillusioned with where pop music was at. It surprised me that in the top 40 songs of 2016, only Him for the Weekend is featured, as to me, Adventure of a Lifetime also appeared to be playing on every radio station and in every public space at this time. Adventure of a Lifetime is an incredibly repetitive song. We have the vocal hooks at the start, which crop up time and time again, specifically on every part where the energy level needs to be high. We have literally the same bass groove being played throughout much of the song. Like many pop songs made in this century, there is no change in chords between the verse and chorus. And then of course, there are the repetitive lead vocal hooks performed by Chris Martin. In the 2010s, having a catchy chorus is not enough. Adding in a catchy pre-chorus is also not enough. I applaud the song for avoiding the pop drop trope. However, right from when Chris starts singing, we can hear the song's intention for maximum earworm value. 
Turn Your Magic On to Me Should Say is a perfectly fine and even indeed quite memorable opening lyric. Martin clearly knew this, because what line does he then use to open the second verse? Likewise, there is a kind of melodic mastery behind how Chris Martin is able to take the foundation of the song and create melodies that flow and fit in with each other so seamlessly and organically. And yet, at the same time, this kind of songwriting means if you don't buy into the world of the song immediately, you could go on to find the listening experience incredibly annoying. I mentioned that 2010's pop songs can sound simplistic, and indeed, this is where the final passage of this song comes in. There's a certain euphoria to the passage in the bridge where Martin begins by singing, if we've only got this life, but very quickly you realise this is a means to get to the lowest common denominator. I've no doubt that if I watched this song being performed live, I could easily find myself swept up in the moment, with the crowd, chanting out the incredibly simple woo-hoos that this song ultimately brings us round to. But is it truly the most satisfying and interesting way that Coldplay could have brought this song to a climax? Whether intentionally or not, the ending of this song specifically helps vindicate all of those who wish to accuse modern pop music of being simplistic, unintelligent and homogenous. Indeed, it was this kind of bland songwriting and over-reliance on production that I was beginning to associate Coldplay with. Watching the footage from this year's Glastonbury Festival, however, did two things to me. First, it forced me to acknowledge that they are indeed a very good live act, and more importantly, it reminded me of earlier hits in their career, songs such as Yellow and Fix You. Now, even Coldplay's earliest songs are by no means the most profound pieces of music ever written, but you cannot deny their resonance. When you try your best but don't succeed, and am I part of the cure or am I part of the disease, are examples of two rather beautiful pieces of lyric writing, and these early songs overall do sound much more authentic compared to later releases. Putting on their debut album Parachutes to listen to in full, it didn't take long for me to see that the early Coldplay were a very different beast. The song Don't Panic kicks things off, immediately treating us to double-tracked acoustic guitars and a much more vulnerable performance from Chris Martin. It is natural that a younger Chris would sound less refined as a vocalist, but what is shocking is how live the vocal feels, and indeed, reading into the making of the album, much of the process was focused on recording the band playing in the room together on analogue tape a shockingly old-school style of recording, even in the year 2000. Another thing that stands out in Don't Panic is the prominence of the electric guitar, and indeed the instrumentation in general. The instruments surrounding Martin's voice are given much more space to shine, and by that I don't just mean in the mix, but with long passages in the song itself that rely not on lyrics, but simply on beautiful melodic playing. Johnny Buckland brings a lot to Coldplay's music in general, and in this song we hear his heavy influence from U2's The Edge, albeit focusing here more on melodic single note patterns, rather than sweeping arpeggios. Fans of Buckland might have noticed a glaring omission from my earlier breakdown of Adventure of a Lifetime, and indeed, now is the time to acknowledge that even in an era of EDM dominance and guitars falling out of favour in mainstream music, still the band refused to go down a Maroon 5 route, seemingly sidelining anyone in the band who isn't the lead singer, and allowing Buckland to have quite a prominent and surprisingly sophisticated lead guitar line be essentially the mainstay of the song's chorus. I give Coldplay huge kudos for this, yet truthfully, it doesn't change my opinion of the song. With the glossy and digital production making the guitar part feel like it has been copied and pasted each time it appears, regardless of whether that is accurate or not. Recording techniques have changed dramatically, even in the last 25 years. Now, a modern music producer would probably say to you that the current way of working one that is very reliant on digital audio workstations, on beat detection, pitch correction, and seemingly smoothing out every texture within the music itself is simply how modern records are made. And indeed, the Coldplay of both 2015 and now are accomplished professional musicians who have had an incredible rate of success in their career. They would know what kind of recording techniques and production methodology they would want to employ when they make an album. And so could it be argued that it was the producer of Parachutes, Ken Nelson, that the band recorded live onto analog tape back in 2000? Well, in October of that same year, Ken Nelson did an interview with the magazine Sound on Sound, 
and in it he said, I do believe that co-production is the best way. I think it's actually harder in a lot of respects to co-produce than to be telling someone, to have this vision of how it should be. He goes on to talk about an experience he had with a group named Gomez. Now this band apparently wanted to be the producers of their album, and so Nelson only operated in an engineering role. It seems to me that since then, he took on perhaps a more equal approach to producing. He wouldn't immediately jump in the director's chair and, and take on like a hierarchical approach, but rather allow many opportunities for the band to have their own input and bring in what they want. Sure, the members of Coldplay might have been young in 2000, but they weren't stupid, and it would seem that they knew exactly what they were doing, choosing to spend six months on and off recording, trying to get the best takes, with little overdubbing and reliance on production trickery. On top of this, although I mentioned the style of digital recording in the 2010s leads to incredible clarity in mixes, let's not forget that Parachutes is still an incredibly clear record, with a production that is clean when it needs to be clean, and a little rougher at other moments, such as the iconic lead guitar part in the song Yellow. Indeed, it should be noted that allegations of Coldplay's music being bland or simplistic have existed ever since the band's inception, and Parachutes itself might have been deemed as clinical by critics and reactionaries of its time. In the 15 years that separates Parachutes from a head full of dreams, a lot has changed, and indeed they had drifted far away from the band who had a song like Shiver, a Nava song with prominent lead guitar that also features all of its lead vocals being from one take, warts and all. In that time, they must have utilised the full spectrum of recording techniques, from the most analogue to the most digital, and as such, Coldplay's career actually gives us our own opportunity to work out for ourselves quite where the line is between commercial music that sounds authentic and commercial music that just sounds clinical. For some, this dividing line might be after the third album, for others the fourth, and indeed for a few it may still have yet to be drawn. For me personally, I see the real changing point being their fifth album, Milo Saitolo. Sure, Viva La Vida took the band into a more outwards facing political direction, with Chris Martin beginning his transition from lonely outsider to outgoing philanthropist, but this album cemented it, bringing along with it more of that meticulous digital sound, as well as quite frankly more of that lowest common denominator approach to hit making. Yes, it could be argued that sixth album Ghost Stories is a much more unique Coldplay album, and one that is more focused on Martin's own personal experiences, yet still this album felt the need to shoehorn in the overly EDM focused and simplistic Sky Full of Stars. Likewise, although everyday life seems less focused on creating hits and is more about celebrating culture and diversity, one could speculate whether it was this album's lack of commercial success which pushed them into teaming up with hit songwriter and producer Max Martin for 2021's Music of the Spheres and this year's Moon Music, as well as releasing a song with BTS in the form of My Universe. It would seem that Coldplay have for a long time now drifted away from the rawer and arguably more authentic style of recording utilised on their debut, and for me that's a shame. Going back to their early output actually gave me more respect for the band and pushed me to see them in a new light. I think there are many things I can take away from Coldplay's music, positive things that I can instill into my own songs, but at the same time I see a clear dividing line, where the focus on clinical production and crafting universal anthems takes away from the creativity and the resonance of the songs themselves. There's more to Coldplay than what a head full of dreams would have you believe. Indeed, there's more to Coldplay than what any one of their albums could tell you on its own. Being a band for 25 years will do that. However, I think that the career that Coldplay have had and the direction that that career has gone in does raise reasonable questions about when a commercial song still manages to retain a sense of authenticity and when a commercial song feels like it has been stripped of all the human soul within it. Now I have to stress that by no means am I trying to say that a song needs to be recorded live in order for it to sound authentic. But between Coldplay's origins and now, I really do feel that we've covered the full spectrum of recording techniques. And therefore, each of us can kind of put into perspective where we draw our own line, 
on when exactly a song stops sounding authentic to us. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate that it's a bit longer than some of my others. But I've really enjoyed making it, and I hope you've enjoyed the points that I've put across. If you'd like to hear more of my video essays and discussions, I will link them in the end screen, as well as some of my own music, which I would love for you to listen to. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and I hope to see you in another video.